And welcome to another episode of Pixel Drone Show. And today I'm actually really excited because, well, I met our guest, Josh. Uh, Josh is the president of Flight Test, and I met him about a year ago. And uh, and I have to say, he's one of my favorite persons in the industry. Uh, and, and the primary reason is Josh is one of the most genuine person I've ever met. He is involved in a lot of different things, and I wanted to bring him on the show so we can kind of pick his brain about how he got involved with all of this and how he built Flight Test and where Flight Test is actually going. There's a lot of things that you may see on YouTube. You may be familiar with their YouTube channel, but there's so many more things that they do on the site. So, Josh, welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be on the show, brother, and thank you for the kind introduction, but just know how blessed we are to have you guys in our life. Uh, the only reason Flight Test has got to where we are is our community and our partners. And uh, it, it can't just be something where we get into model aviation and then it ends there. It has to go beyond that. And what you guys have done with your programs, uh, with your educational tools, has given people really just no limits on where they want to go within flight, but also with their passion. So, uh, brother, it's an honor to be your friend and it's also an honor to work with you. Thank you. Well, appreciate that. So let's let's start from the beginning. How did you yeah. get started with aviation? How did you catch the bug? And yeah. I know you also fly manned aircraft. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, I'm very fortunate. Um, I had a dad who had a, a passion for flying. He had his pilot's license before I was even born. And before I was born, um, he was restoring airplanes in a garage. We didn't have cars in the garage. We had parts of airplanes in the garage. So I uh, lived out in a little tiny farm uh, airport, uh, 1,000 feet long, trees on both sides. And uh, my dad flew a little BC-12 detailer craft. And my earliest memories were walking down to the hangar, which is about halfway down the runway, you know, climbing in this little tiny airplane. Uh, at a young age, uh, five or six, I don't think the FAA is going to hear this, but I knew how to uh, make the mags hot and hold the brakes. And I would actually scooch down in, in the lower parts and, and hit those heel brakes as hard as I could. And and we would uh, proceed to take off. And uh, that was that was kind of my childhood. It was a pretty unique one. My dad used flight to connect with me. We had so many great memories. And uh as time went on, that little tiny airport became just too unsafe because I was getting bigger. My brother was getting bigger to get out, and the trees were always getting taller. So we moved the airplane off the runway, and then another chapter of what my dad was passionate about, which was model aviation, kind of came to life. And that was the one uh, thing that really changed everything for me. Um, we would sit shoulder to shoulder. We would build for three or four months, and then we'd go out. And I was probably about seven years old at the time. Uh, there's a glider called the Gentle Lady. I think a lot of people that are in the hobby will know about that. And we would uh, proceed to pull it back on a big rubber band called a high start, launch it, and I was the worst pilot ever. I would put it right into the trees next to the runway every time, <laughs> blow this plane apart. And, you know, you expect the parent to be like, what are you doing? We spent three months doing this. And, no, my dad would help me pick up the pieces. And then we'd have three more months putting this thing back together. And, uh, you know, it took me – I started at seven. It wasn't really till 12 years old that I was actually fairly competent with flying airplanes. But I had five years of education, encouragement, love, and um, that really is what shaped my life. It was the failures and it was the putting those pieces back together. And um, that sparked my passion not only for flying, uh, but also for uh, design and for just the rewards that overcoming obstacles and overcoming difficulties and then also encouraging other really goes. Um, I, I've said this many times before. You know, flight is a great vehicle to connect with people, but it's the failures that really bring those learning moments out. And with model aviation specifically, I mean, you got one every day. You can you can choose to crash and make the best of it, or you can choose to crash and walk away. And, and what we want people to do with flight test is every aspect, the building, the flying, the designing, the failures is something to be celebrated. So that, that got my, my path going. And uh, the, to my shame, I, I didn't really have a passion for making this a career until I got out of high school and was actually young married. And um, I thought you had to have a conventional job. And uh, I want to break that mold. I want to see that really change. But my dad, from from that point uh, early on and then all the way up through where, again, I try to say saying this, I sold it at 16. Uh, I would uh, be able to leave school a little early. I would go out to the airport and I'd use up all my dad's gas. And I would you know get a prop from the airport manager. And I was gone. I was flying every chance I could get with his little Taylor craft. And uh, we had the best time. Wow. That's that's, that, that's that's awesome. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all. Now that that you said this and knowing who you are, it it, it totally makes sense. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's awesome that your dad got you uh, into that hobby so uh, so early on. I mean, and I don't know of many people who've been that fortunate where their parents get them into a hobby or a sport or some other passion and, and get kids uh, involved uh, that much uh, from such an early age. Uh, oh, another thing yeah. uh, that, that I want to uh, shift gears a little bit to that you've been doing for quite some time as well is uh, this YouTube channel. I was just going through your videos and apart from the fact that you guys are close to getting 2 million uh, subscribers on your channel, I noticed that you've been uh, running this channel for 10 years now which is incredible yeah. i think okay you tell us a little bit about the background there and how they got started yeah yeah well and, and here's a funny thing i'm gonna say the words again my dad my family um every every tuesday night we would be flying with people uh, i kind of grew up in a little bit of a bubble where uh it was the hobby was a social aspect and uh as we would meet on tuesday nights and we'd fly together and everything that kind of became a, a big part of my life and, and a lot of those people are still in my life today um, I was doing an outreach ministry. When my wife and I got married, we were both in youth ministry and we noticed a really big issue where kids weren't connected with their families. I could literally walk into someone's house to take them and, and pick up their child to go to church. And I would want to meet the parents and the parents are like, just take the kid. They didn't want to know me. They didn't want to know where the kid was yeah. going. They just wanted to offload their child on me. And, and that is something that's absolutely heartbreaking and unacceptable. So we created this ministry to, to literally find a common activity for parents and kids to connect around. And um, what happened from there is we were doing it for about two to three years. And a gentleman named Chad Capper, uh, who was getting into FPV and I was into FPV, uh, met me through a mutual friend, Eric. And uh, that spurred a, a friendship. And from that point, uh, he contacted me and said, hey, I want to do this crazy YouTube show called Flight Test. And my only yeah. stipulation was is that it had to stay family friendly, had to be educational, encouraging, uplifting, and um, and he agreed. Uh, that's when Flight Test was born, and that's when we started it. Uh, like I said, over ten years ago, and then about uh, I think a year and a half into that was when uh, I left my full time job. I pursued Flight Test full time, and I started designing airplanes specifically meant to give people the experience both building and flying. And uh, about a year after that uh, was when I was blessed to be able to run the company. That's awesome. Do you, do you still remember the first video that you guys made for uh, for YouTube <laughs> yes, 10 years ago? Yes. I do. I do because it's where I met my best friend. Um, Josh Scott was the original co-host with me. I didn't realize Josh yeah. and I had a friendship uh, and actually a connection beforehand until suddenly he showed up. And um, to this day, he is one of the heroes of my life. He is just one of the most – talk about a genuine person. Uh, mm -hmm. The talent that this young man has uh, – and the heart for people and the heart for also documenting history, specifically around World War II and preserving that wisdom, uh, is just unparalleled. Take it on top of that, his ability to sing, play like seven different instruments, and um, his acting skills is just incredible. So I remember it really, really clear. And I also remember how terrible I was. Uh, I showed up in a shirt that was like really thin lined. And I remember Chad looking like, Josh, you realize if we film you in that, you're going to be like that Doppler effect, you know? And so uh, <laughs> it, was a, it was a learning curve for me. And, and I'm so still to this day, I'm uncomfortable in front of the camera. Uh, but uh, I remember that day like yesterday. And it also felt really special because like, okay, we get to take a really cool message and a really cool encouragement. And we get to put on this platform and we had no clue where it was going to go. Um, I really feel like it was after the first year that we found our legs where it wasn't just about doing reviews for Hobby King products um, and, and airplanes in general. It was more about equipping people to overcome problems, but also connect, going back to mm -hmm. those roots. And uh, that was when I got the opportunity to leave my full-time job and start designing airplanes that I wanted to make sure we really stuck to that. Uh, a lot of people kind of get frustrated because they want to talk about flight and I want to talk about flam families, but flight is a lifestyle. It's not something that's usually uh, fully benefited from unless you make it something that can kind of be embraced by the whole family. And, um, yeah. you know, you can use the hobby to escape or you can use the hobby to connect. And I really wanted flight tests to just basically, yes, celebrate flight, but celebrate what flight can do more. And I think that's been one of the sources that have given us nonstop creativity uh, because we're not just designing airplanes to, you know, meet a niche. We're designing an experience, but also this, this group here that we work with every day, we're just like a bag full of crazy cats. And uh, we hear a suggestion from a community member, or we have an idea while we're chomping down on lunch. And, it, and it, it's exactly what I want people to emulate at home. We just got a camera so after so did you, uh, at what point did you look at this and you're like, okay, this is getting big. This is going to be like my full-time job. This is going to be what mm -hmm. I'm going to do for probably the rest of my life. <laughs> that that point um, was probably about a year after I actually left my full-time job. Uh, I painted 
for about 10 years, I was a copy repairman. And it's funny how God has a sense of humor because you have chapters in your life that give you different skills. And every one of those different chapters from being a waiter to a copy repairman to a mechanic to auto body had a key role in playing where I am today. Um, but uh, my wife and I, like I said, we were doing the ministry. We were doing, I was doing a full-time job. Um, I was telling parents to, to you know, connect with your family, but I was working my tail off and not doing the same thing. I was being a hypocrite. And I remember going to my wife and saying, Jen, I, I, I love what I'm doing with flight test. And I, and I feel called to do that. I want to do that. And she's like, yeah, and we prayed about it. And then next thing you know, uh, unfortunately, my father was uh, passing away from cancer. So we said, okay, this is a time to make some lifestyle ch changes. And uh, we sold our house. My mom was uh, obviously newly widowed. And uh, we decided, let's go ahead and help her out. There's a family farm with that runway that needed, you know, kind of, she just needed help for a short time. Sold the house, uh, liquidated all debt, and then we we moved in uh, with her and, and helped her out for about a year to get on her feet and just kind of get the property in order. Um, it was during that time when I was able to fully focus on that that we realized what a need there was for something like flight test, but also what a privilege it was. And and that was when uh, the, the light bulb went off. I remember the first kit because my wife had been a stay at home mom uh, all her life, and we have two awesome kids. Day two of me getting that job and, and, and going in there, I, I called her up. I said, Jen, I can design planes. I can talk about planes, but I can't manufacture planes. I need some real big help. And she drove up and uh, gutted the whole little one-car garage and, and rearranged it. And to this day, um, she actually still runs you know, manufacturing. She, she stepped back into that role. But the flow of taking raw materials through the laser, through the stocking, through the shipping, and then out the door – went from one car to garage to now what we have is over 11 lasers and, and she runs a great department. And, and uh, those guys are laughing sometimes more than we are, which is just really awesome. But uh, I couldn't, I couldn't do it without her. And it was awesome to see those first kits uh, going out the door. And the, the garage we started with didn't even have a heater in it. We had this little propane. It was like a bad little uh, Christmas carol, you know, with, with the little coal, you know, and the, the Bob ratchet and, and everything, you know, keeping himself warm. We had a little propane heater and, uh, it was just such a joy to make a plane, put it in a box, ship it out the door. And from, from the first day we opened that store, I think was the day that really we realized uh, this is going to be something special, that, that the community is endorsing it and embracing it, but also what we can do in people's lives is, is really special too. Wow. So uh, Josh, and I mean this in the most flattering way, um, you have a complex brand um, with a lot of outlets, including the Community Association, Flight Fest, educational programs, um, the YouTube page. And I think I said the store already, but just in case, yeah. um, is there anything else um, we can expect? Anything on the horizon or anything that I missed there? Yeah, it's like the spokes of the wheel. Um, and I'm happy that you, you brought that out. It is, it is complex. Um, one of our, our dear friends and team members here said it's like an explosion that keeps exploding. Uh, flight is a tool that can go into every crack, and if you can find a benefit for it, as Flight Test as a brand, we want to grow into that. Not that we want to be all things to all people, but we want to make sure that if there's a need somewhere that we have the skill set to, to meet, we can do so. So like you said, yeah, um, FT STEM, although it's not the biggest thing we talk about, that is probably the number one thing I'm most passionate about. Just because how flight affected me as a kid, I recognize that there's not kids that have parents that, that have that tool. Uh, if anything, if I can get kids to have that passion in school, take it home to their parents, it's the best bait and switch because now the parents can actually jump into that activity too. Um, the store obviously meets the needs of that. Um, FTCA, which recently opened up, um, is is near and dear to our heart. So uh, what you can see right now is us putting meat around the FTCA, that's the Flight Test Community Association. And our goal is not just to become another club. Um, we don't even call them clubs, we call them groups. And there's a real good reason why. Uh, a club has to have a physical location, like a flying site and things like that. But what if a group collapsed on a location that benefited them, a.k.a. a local hobby shop or a local school or a church basement or a guy's basement? Um, those are important things because, again, flight is not just about the act of flying. It's the, it's the whole journey up to that. That's the biggest reward. Our community really gets that with our Flight Fest events. And we need to find a way where we can give our community uh, now a place to collapse on a common location and also a way to easily network with one another. So what you're going to see in the near future is uh, we're going to be using the miracle of the Internet and app-based technology that we're doing where our community can locate each other real easy. And we have something called FT groups. And those FT groups, once they're identified, they can say, hey, listen, we're going to do a build night. 
and they can put a 25 uh, mile circle out. They can have it only go to their group members. They can have it go to the general public as an outreach. Um, they'll have the flexibility to make their own events. What I don't want people to do is think that flight test is a bunch of knuckleheads behind a YouTube channel that, that you know, crash planes and laugh a lot. That's part of it. I want flight test to be talked about as it's this amazing community of people that really love connecting with people through flight. And the FTCA is going to be exactly that mechanism. Uh, right now, we're working really hard. I'm going back in the design world and trying to design a bunch of really cool looking trainer airplanes that people can pick from, but also make a video series um, of how to train the trainers and also a beginner series of how to um, basically learn to fly again using DIY as a method versus uh, buy and fly. And that's going to be... That's going to be quite an undertaking. Um, you guys obviously just do the most amazing educational content. And you know that every word you say is just super weighted. So we want to do that right. But then hopefully when we have that resource pull out, we'll be able to give groups the tools to either have a build night or have a, uh, um, a training night, things like that. Uh, my heart's also for the local hobby shops. Uh, hobby shops and brick and mortars, they put a lot out there. You know, they're bringing product in their store. They're hoping people come and buy it. And with... Um, with China and with, with all these models coming in from overseas, it's kind of a race to the bottom and that hurts them. My thought and my vision is if we can take a hobby shop and we can shift the perspective of being a place where you just go and pick something up and leave to a place where you have an experience. Um, I think that is something that will hands down beat just going online, and buying it and ordering it. Not saying that that's bad because we have an online store too, but I would like to see these hobby shops that are mostly empty, make a build area in their back. And then we have a TV, we have a webcam, and then we do these live builds. But also, they can actually host a place of experience where people can come in, they can learn, and they can teach. A couple things happen then. When you bring someone into the hobby, they remember you. They remember where they got that in, uh, they got that knowledge. There's a relationship there. If you have a build night, you're not only building a friendship with that person at that hobby shop, but you're also building friendships with the people that you're building with. And those people will come back and, and gather. Um, if I want to get a cup of coffee and pay a buck, I'll go to McDonald's drive through I'll drink coffee. If I want to connect with a friend for two hours without feeling awkward about it, I'll pay four bucks for a burnt cup of Starbucks. Um, I'm sorry, I don't like Starbucks coffee. Yeah, neither but, do uh, I. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be um, no anyway, harm done. I do not no like Starbucks. But I do like their scones. Um, but, uh, but, you know, you, you have different environments. And in some environments, you're willing to pay that $4 and, and, and you know, sit there and connect with a friend. What if we shift the perspective of a hobby shop to not just be a place to buy and leave, but a place to actually have that connection, have that knowledge exchange, have those yeah. training nights. Now, suddenly, the longer people stay there, the more they're going to buy, the more they're going to support it. Um, I'm, a, I'm a businessman as well as a person that really cares about outreach. I want to see these local brick and mortars be rewarded for, for you know, being in this environment where it's very, very um, competitive. And I think that we have a product line that can, can go right into that niche, can get a lot of our community members to, to kind of adopt a store. And then from there, we can do a lot more than just change lives, but we can also help businesses. You know, you know it's funny you say that because I, I see this in, uh, in my local bike shop, um, the mountain yeah. biking shops here. This is exactly what they do. They, they create a community and they help the community and give back and, and they help the kids in the schools and they have kids program in the evening. They have a summer camp. But the, the local bike shop is more than just going there to, to get yeah. your bike fixed or to buy a bike. They, they've created this thing. So I, I love that concept and I think that's going to be very successful. Well, thank you for that. And I love that. I love that analogy. Yeah, it's you don't just do it there, but you, you're you going to take it elsewhere. And uh, I'm sure those people go on bike rides together and everything. And um, that's beautiful. Uh, I'm happy to know that that model works because it's going to be a, it's gonna be a little bit of risk on our part. And I don't want to also have people adopt something that's going to cause them extra work, but not a good reward. No, um, it'll be rewarding for sure. Oh, quick follow up. Um, What's your process for creating products? Do you have a team? Um, is it informed on the feedback you get from possibly your YouTube videos? A lot of the, you have a lot of thoughtful commenters in there. I'm just curious about that. That's a great point. Um, so it's a couple of different ways that we design airplanes and bring product. Um, first thing we do is we don't bring a product without a need. Uh, there has to be a need, whether it's uh, a, a need for, I want this one niche airplane that doesn't exist in any other way. And Like I love the Polycarpoff. Um, you know, it's like, okay, man, there's a piece of history here that's really cool, but no one has a model airplane that we need to do this. But also it can get to much more simple stuff as uh, mainly for STEM. Like there is a need for a plane that can fly in something that's smaller than a football field. 
Um, so it's it's easy for kids to learn. There's space for them, even in the smallest schools with maybe dense areas around them. Um, that maybe a plane that weighs under 250 grams, so we can kind of you know overcome that hurdle. Uh, it always has to have a need, uh, whether it's a, a major need or a small need. Uh, from that point on, uh, I got a dear partner. His name is John Overstreet. He designs. His background is in metalwork, and he's also an artist. So he can kind of picture how how foam needs to wrap around things, and he has the skills with computers and 3D to be able to draw that. Uh, I'm not gifted that way. I think in a very two dimensional world. So my passion and my my gift is with entry level, simple build. Uh, even if it looks terrible, it's going to fly awesome. So oftentimes you'll see my plants look more like cartoons than they do, you know, scale aircraft. Um, but that's kind of the process that we go. And from that point on, we won't just build one and say, okay, it flies, it's good. We'll build one. And then right now the, the plane that I have designed that we're about to release, uh, we were training people on it last night. People had never flown before, and we're getting their feedback because it's a trainer. I have one of our team members who hasn't built for a, a while uh, building it who hasn't no, no videos, just, okay, go in, knowing what you know about our planes, and then try it. Uh, we're shipping them out. So we rely super heavily on our community's feedback. We have beta builders all over. We'll drop kits in their laps and uh, say, give us your feedback. Let us know what you think. And then we'll switch it up and get a different beta builder next time. Um, sometimes our community members will come out and say, hey, you know, we really want this. I'm like, yeah, okay, we could do that for you. It doesn't matter if we sell 100 or we sell 10 because we manufacture here in the U.S., okay it's just we want to make sure it meets me it's awesome i i love how you guys focus on on building that community and bringing people together around uh, flying model aircraft and um, greg told me that you guys had bought a golf course recently so i'm trying to kind of figure out how that fits into your bigger picture uh, <laughs> and how yeah. do you guys use the golf course when it's all about flying airplanes can you, can you tell us more about that I got the coolest wife in the world, by the way, um, because I come for weird stuff. I mean, just imagine this. I go home and say, sweetheart, I think we're going to need to sell our house. And, you know, I want to go uh, basically go from six figures to under 30 grand a year and then make my own way uh, with flight test. Uh, I went to her and I said, sweetheart, I really want to buy this golf course. And she's like, what? <laughs> and I explained, you know, we, we've been praying and looking for a destination location. That's what we call Edgewater. Yeah. A place where we can do exactly what my dad did with me at that little tiny airport in our backyard where people can come out, we can engage them, we can teach them, we can encourage them, love on them, but also we can train other people to do the same. And uh, what kind of grieved me was all these YouTube videos we were doing, we got to connect with our, our friends here. You know, I got to, to do a video with Stefan or Josh Scott um, or Alex or Austin, uh, but there's so many community members. And when we go to Flight Fest, we love engaging them. We thought, okay, we can't come to everybody, but we can give people a place to come. And then while they're here, we can have that time with them. We can make that memory. Um, but more importantly, without us even having them be involved, they have a place to do that same with their own family. So my good friend Lee, who's actually the director of business development here, we've been friends for 11, 12 years. He was the first person that came up. And when I was doing this ministry, he said, Josh, I love you, but you're running like a chicken with your head cut off. You're trying to train everybody you're trying to you're the basically the person that connects with them but you're also the person that keeps the the growth from happening and what he encouraged mm -hmm. me to do is teach the dad teach the mom and then help them engage the kid and then get out of the way and that's exactly what yeah. we do here at Ed water so we did a crowdfund we kind of shared this vision that we wanted to have kind of like the disneyland of flight where every aspect of flight could be enjoyed where we could do these outreach programs educational programs and we did a crowdfund, not to buy the land, but to just develop it. Now, we didn't want the, mm -hmm. the burden of the, of the note to be on um, flight tests. We didn't want it to be fully funded where it was like a charity. We just wanted to be able to get enough money to be able to make a headquarters and then get the ball rolling. Uh, my wife and I personally chose to take on the risk of the debt. Uh, and that only, also, we can keep the vision, the outreach, the ministry, the education always protected no matter what. And uh, that crowdfund, which was over $200,000, was met in six days from our amazing community. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, we, we were weeping over it. It was just, it was just crazy, the outpouring of uh, basically 2,300 people um, got us to uh, 340 plus thousand dollars to do this. Uh, what we then did was, rather than, uh, you know, say, okay, let's hire contractors and stuff, we general contracted it ourselves. Um, I went to college for architecture, and I had some GC training. And um, we GC'd it, and basically we're able to stretch that money so far. We started putting up pavilions and fire pits and, and just really stepping up what this place could be 
That's amazing. I mean, and, and it makes me wonder, is that place still being used as a golf course as well? Or is it purely for, for community and, and flying and all that yeah. stuff? So the answer is yes. Uh, we basically have about 30 acres sliced off of the 120 acres. And we run the golf on the one side. And that then takes care of all the maintenance, all the yard uh, keep, upkeep, everything uh, for mm -hmm. the whole entire property. And then when we have a really big event like FPV Fest, we just shut the whole place down. Um, yeah. It's kind of funny. We originally pictured where we're just going to shut it down and it was only going to be like an event place every day for model aviation. We had 300 people come out to our first uh, house, uh, open house. And mm -hmm. we had the place shut down. We had them flying everywhere. It was a ghost town. It's like, did everyone leave? Where is everybody? <laughs> we So we jump on the golf cart and start driving around. And sure enough, there's 300 people on the property. But that's an average of less than three people per acre. <laughs> so it yeah. was... The, the downside was it wasn't intimate anymore. It was scattered. So what we decided to do is like, okay, rather than spending thousands of dollars every month, let's go ahead and let the golf course run on the one side. And, and my wife and I actually run that part too. And then all that maintenance, all that yard you know, upkeep and stuff is handled for the whole grounds. And if you drive out here, you'll see a, a beautifully manicured place that's uh, uh, well kept. And so we just run kind of two business models. The byproduct of that is we're actually getting golfers to get into the hobby. And uh, if you know the demographic of golfers, you know, it's a little bit older. Uh, yeah, yeah. They'll come out, they'll line up their golf carts right along the road, and they'll see us walking out with a big monstrous airplane and watermelons. And they'll be like, what are they doing? And they'll watch, and suddenly, you know, watermelons are falling from the sky and leaving divots, and we're high five, and they'll cheer. And then they walk on, and they finish <laughs> off their game with a little juicy bit of, of gossip. Next thing you know, they're out here the Thursday night when we're doing the free training, and they're like, you know, they have their grandkids with them. And they're like, I told my grandkids about yeah. these watermelons. And they're like, oh, flight tests. And suddenly grandma and grandpa are like the cool people. And they're bringing their kids out or their grandkids out. Last night, I had a grandfather, a father, and his three children, uh, two boys and a girl, um, all there together. And that stemmed from the golf. <laughs> it didn't stem from a YouTube video on flight tests. It stemmed from them watching us fly all these crazy airplanes, getting interested in a brought it together. So um, you'll find that, that my passion, my tools flight, uh, connecting people through a common activity is really something anybody can do, whether it's golf, whether it's camping, whether it's baseball, whether it's football. Um, my passion just lies in flight. And that's going to be what I'm going to use. And frankly, I think it's the coolest. But, um, you know, whatever it takes uh, to get people connected is uh, what I want to see happen. Well, this yeah, is a perfect transition. Yeah. yeah, this is the perfect transition to my next question, actually, because I want to talk about the STEM program and what FT STEM does. So tell yeah. us more about what these programs are, how are they available, uh, can, can the, the teachers use them? T tell us more about STEM, FT STEM. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, first of all, FT STEM is a K-12 through curriculum. We actually go all the way into college. A lot of colleges are using um, some of our engineering you know, uh, modules and curriculum to kind of get kids, you know, warmed up into the world of design because it, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty advanced if you want to make it that way. Uh, we had a, a dear friend named Jake Marshall. He's still on the team and, and he's our curriculum developer along with Trevor Sill. Uh, there's, I think, 21 standards to call yourself STEM. And not everybody really listens to those standards, but we really want to be by the book. And it does a couple of things for schools. It, it tells the teacher, listen, this is truly an educational program. You're going to have success. Kids are going to be able to use this. It's going to be recognized. You can get grants from it and so forth and so on. Uh, we wanted to make sure it was truly STEM in every sense of the matter. Not that it's just something where you, you buy this thing, you build it, you fly it, you get a grade. That is not STEM. STEM is where you're taking science, technology, and engineering, math, and don't forget literacy and reading and writing um, to attack a problem and how to attack that problem. What we taught kids is uh, something called the EDM model, engineering design model. And what that teaches a child is we say, okay, here's your problem. And obviously it's going to be themed in flight. The way they attack it through the EDM models, we teach them to do research first. Once they take that research, so they come up with an idea. Once they come up with that idea, they then test that idea. And then the most important part, and this is the part they get graded on, is they communicate their journey of how they attack that idea. And if they fail when they test it, they go back to research. So many times in today's schools, it's just, it's heartbreaking. They're taught to memorize things. They're taught to yeah. regurgitate, you know, certain, certain information to get a grade. They're not taught how to analytically attack a problem. And when you get out into the business world, if you are given a task and you fail 10 times, but you document that well, you learn what happened and you go back, 
And then you go to your boss and says, okay, it took me 11 times. Here's what failed the first 10 times. And here's what worked. You just gave that boss so much more value than just stumbling into the solution right off the bat, because now you have knowledge that's been gained. And I really want kids to understand that, um, you know, how, how do you properly attack a problem is, is, is crucial to give you success in business. And how do you communicate how you've uh, overcome that? Uh, that? That also benefits you in life, too. So amazing curriculum uh, developers that we have here. And uh, we teach kids how to, obviously, safety. We teach them about the tools that they use. And then we start teaching, bringing in the flight aspect in the engineering aspect. And um, at, at kindergarten, these kids are just obviously they can't use razor blades and stuff like that. They're they're learning about center of gravity and they can't uh, uh, write down a design brief, which is basically that whole journey is what we call a design brief. But what they can do is say, hey, when I moved the weight to the back, the plane didn't fly good. When I moved it all the way to the front, it flew like a dart. But when I put it here, it flew the furthest. They can understand that cause and effect and moving. That's a kindergarten. By the time they're in third and fourth grade, they're flying their first RC airplanes that we call the easy series. And that's where they uh, they put together a little airplane that has two motors, a control board. And these kids that are six, seven years old can fly like straight up bosses. It is absolutely incredible. And then we take after that series where they build them, we go ahead and give them blanks that have just templates. And then they start learning about the moment. So for example, the, the most successful stuff we have with our easy series is different wing configurations. And they learn the configuration of a canard. They learn the configuration of a swept back wing. They learn about an angular wing. And then we go ahead and we say, okay, here's your blank. Take those characteristics and design something that's in your mind and, and make it fly based on what you learned. And they do. Uh, last night, there was a young man. I, I don't think he's much older than nine years old. I had to take a picture of his airplane because it flew so good. I'm like, son of a gun. I never thought about it. He's like, yeah, I had some tip stall issues. So I went ahead and he put reflex into the tips, you know, wash out. I'm like, I didn't think about washout. And he just put a little crink on the crinkle on the on the corner. And I'm like, <laughs> like it, you know, take a picture. I got a picture with him too. And this is from a young man that's like nine years old. And 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 he was already attacking the problems and, and he made a motor glider. That was the thing that just blew my mind. He made a motor glider out of this. By the time they're in seventh grade, they're a full blown RC aircraft. My hope is that they're getting 107s because I want them to make their career path established and start pursuing it. Even if they don't end up there, they need to learn how to set goals and how to attack those goals. Mm -hmm. So uh, ftstem.com is our, is our website. And this is not from Bixler's brain to the kids. You don't want that. This is from much better people, um, teachers that actually are teaching this, writing this up. And we do modular base, which is basically guided learning from the students. So the student has all the information, the teacher just sets them up, the full blown curriculum where the teacher can make a, a class last a full nine weeks if they want, or even a full year on every aspect of aviation. At the end, um, you know, it's not just about making more pilots, it's about, it's about making more engineers, it's about making people that have a passion for maintenance, um, air traffic control, marketing. Um, the kids are primed and ready to go and they see the reward of why math is important, why literacy is important. And uh, it's been great. We have about 3,000 students, uh, not counting our home-based educators or homeschoolers. Um, that is way, way bigger and over 700 teachers currently enrolled. Now, you're not required to use our program to enroll. So that's just the teachers that have enrolled and the students that have enrolled in their online hangar. Uh, what that gives people the ability with our online thing, again, talking about kind of knitting uh, communities together, students can network with students and teachers can network with teachers and actually share projects and share information. And uh, it's as deep as you want it to be or as shallow as you want it to be. You know, there's a lot of teachers that wake up and they're like, I'm just tired and I want to be successful. We have something for them. For the teachers that are like, we got to get in these kids' heads and we got to get into their hearts and we got to change their lives. We can go that deep as well too. Um, you've mostly answered my next question, but um, I did read about you um, and your, your programs working with at-risk youth. And what would you say is the biggest um, impact on that group of um, kids? Because I think that's really phenomenal, um, everything that you're doing so far for youth especially. Oh, thank you. Yeah, at risk and stuff, it's, it's crazy. Um, kids need a passion in their heart. It, it goes down to basic things, relation building, um, going back to the ministry things. When people aren't connected with their family, there's a lot of things that put the kids at risk. The aspect of flight kind of fixes a lot of that because it puts something in their heart. It gives them an activity. Um, also behavior wise, 
when kids are passionate about something, their focus is heightened. Their their desire to learn is, is heightened. Um, Lee, Lee sent me a picture of these two young kids, and uh, he used to do substitute teaching. And we use this model program, again, as a ministry, but also going into schools. These kids would literally, it was like Hatfields and McCoys. They were fighting, literally fist to fist fighting constantly where they always had to be separated in the school. They could not be around each other. They could not fix it. They pulled them in a room and had them build airplanes together. <laughs> these kids are scrappy kids. I got a picture of these kids flying together and they, there's, there's no focus on each other. There's all focus on this thing that they put together and flying. Um, it, it changed their lives. Not because suddenly, you know, something went into them and it healed them and fixed them. It's because there was a distraction. It was because there was something that they're both passionate about and they're able to build a bridge, a relationship together that was based on that one thing. Uh, that also works in families too. And, and when I think of at risk, I don't think about only underrepresented kids in schools, but I think about broken families at home. Um, when you can have that shoulder time, and, and that's what we call it, where a teenager that's 13 years old, pumped full of hormones and wants to square off with his dad that he doesn't know very well, or his dad doesn't engage him very well, suddenly start focusing on this activity of putting something together. And they go through just what I described earlier in this, this interview, uh, the, the failures, the encouragement. There's a lot of healing that can happen there, but also there's a bridge that can bear that weight of truth, that that um, that sharing of information, encouragement that kind of penetrates a little bit better. Um, we've gone been able to go into uh, a lot of underrepresented schools and a lot of at-risk um, children and introduce something like the drone program, where kids um, I don't want to sound bad, their mindset on where they can go in life is just limited. They haven't been exposed to new technologies and new opportunities. This is a really friendly way to say, hey, listen, try this out. And I'm like, holy cow, this can be done. And, and furthermore, I have the ability to make this happen, and I can create something that, that flies through the air. It, it changes their mindset. But if I walked straight up to a kid and said, you've been created with an amazing mind, and you have a, an amazing talent, and I want to do this, I'd be like, you're weird. Get away from me. You know, This activity just breaks down all those boundaries where – it's like, hey, let's put this together and fly it. And the second they realize they're capable of that, you can start feeding in that encouragement. And uh, uh, there's a gentleman that's just a, a real hero of mine. His name is Trevor Sill. He works on the FD STEM. He does this on a daily basis. And he goes in and identifies the needs of the schools and just kind of the demographic. Where are you at with things? What kind of needs do you have? And that could be the difference between a small gremlin, you know, the little drone that flies through the air, or a, you know, race wings or uh, tiny trainers. He kind of custom outfits based on that school's needs. And what a lot of people in our community are doing is they're saying, wow, this, this plan I can put together in 15 minutes. Little Johnny or Nancy only have 20 minutes of attention span. This is the right fit for me. And they can work it in. And yeah. um, it's, it's just exciting to see how this hobby changes lives. And, and yes, uh, you can take a, a child that is a problem child and you can put them on a path um, for success. That's that's awesome. Um, I think that's really smart to uh, to get them uh, get them something in their hands that they can uh, use their skills and their knowledge and, and build that up and uh, have something to go for. Um, how does that work with the Flight Test Community Association? How does that fit into this big uh, bigger picture? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and the answer is yes. I mean, the FTCA, the Flight Test Community Association, is taking everything that we're talking about right now and it's bundling up as a resource pool for people. Um, when people join the FTCA, again, it's not about the club and what club do you belong to and the bureaucracy and what mm -hmm. rankings you have. It's more about, okay, you have a heart to impact people through flight. Here are all the tools that we have. Here's all the knowledge that we have. And we want to give this to you so you have the ability to use it. Um, think about it as arrows in the quiver uh, versus, um, you know, just another club that you pay dues to and fly at. Again, for me, flight is so much deeper than just the act of bringing your plane out and flying it. That is amazing. I'm not I'm not taking anything away. I just only view that as about 20% of the hobby. The 80% before that is really where something special can happen. And our community gets that. They get it every time that they have a flight fest event and they're building these build tents and they're running out and then they're flying. But what are they doing within an hour? They're putting it up in combat. But uh, the FTCA, the FTC is really taking the things that our community identifies. And flight test kind of grew up through the internet, which means it was much more of a grassroots effort. We didn't have to put something that existed and then redefine it and move it over. We got to kind of create it from something new. And uh, because of that, 
the people that see value in, in using flight as a tool like what we're describing, um, they need that. We, we have failed and I have failed to really put a good mechanism in place where they can go and be part of something where they have that, that resources. Along with that, um, you guys know as well as I do, there is so much regulation coming down. And I just imagine a world without being able to do what we do right now, that's not a, that's not a good thing. <laughs> we got to protect it. So the other aspect of FTCA is, is partnering with people like you guys to um, communicate the benefits of the hobby, to make as many people uh, aviation advocates and, and pilots and engineers as, as possible to show how it should be a protected resource, not something that's limited and regulated. Well, let's let's talk about that. Actually, this is a good transition because the yeah. FAA is about to release uh, 9157 Charlie, which is the advisory circular, which will yeah. allow for the development of CBOs, community-based organizations. So FTCA, I'm assuming, will become or will apply at least to become a CBO. How does this change in your mind? What do you think this will allow you to do um, from a regulatory standpoint that at the moment you really can't do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, CBOs, uh, for people listening, there was, uh, I believe it was under Section 349, and I'm really bad with numbers, so if I say something wrong, please correct me. Um, 2019 or 2018 Congressional yeah. Act, Section 349, I believe, uh, there was mandates around a CBO, and uh, you had to have an educational program, you had to have events, you had to have a physical location to meet, you had to have a 501c3, and I want to say... If there was one more I'm forgetting. Maybe I, I meshed two in together. There's five five key points. We made sure immediately that we met all those points uh, so we could continue to protect the hobby because at the time, it wasn't uncertain whether people would be able to fly and enjoy it without being part of Oh, safety guidelines. That's it, safety guidelines. Yeah. Um, so with the new advisory circular and the advisory or the comment period being open uh, over, my hope is, is that we'll actually have some trust from the FAA to be able to connect and meet the needs of our community and also be a barrier between regulation and them. Uh, one thing I see that could be very helpful and healthy is that we can say, okay, the FTCA, the Flight Test Community Association, here's our safety guidelines, here is what we're doing to meet the requirements of the FAA to establish FRIAs, which is basically flight sites. Um, and the FAA, we got this. It's, it's no different than, than saying, okay, you have this big bucket there's lots of different demographics within in this big bucket. We are very skilled with being able to make sure that this part of this demographic is operating safely and in compliance with what you want. Now leave us alone. <laughs> Let us do our thing and grow the hobby and, and bring people into your world. Um, that's what we're hoping for. Uh, I have no doubt that we're going to be able to meet every requirement and exceed it. I, I think in many aspects, the FTCA, thanks to our community, is, is the benchmark to what other CBOs should be measured against. Uh, it's offensive to me when um, I hear about a place in a CBO that has uh, been around, but their educational program is more of an afterthought. Their, uh, their focus is more on, on community dues and things like that. It should be permission-based. Um, if someone has to pay to have a relationship with you, is it a relationship or is it a partnership or is a, is a service exchange? Nothing's wrong with either one of them, but don't, don't call it a community. Um, we want to make sure that people have the right to choose uh, where they go and, and who they belong to, and also that they identify with the vision and the goals. Uh, you hear me talk a lot about fuzzy feely stuff. Flight test is very fuzzy feely. You've seen these events. You see the families out there. There's something deeper than flight going on. I understand that maybe we are not everything to everybody, and I completely respect that. And I also am really grateful for other CBOs that do meet those needs of those people. It, it can't be one fit for everybody um, because not everyone identifies with that. Uh, but I really want to see some clarity where we can be a, a, I hate to say a barrier between the FAA and the regulations where we meet those needs, but we also make this as approachable as possible. Uh, every boundary and every barrier that the FAA puts between the hobbyist and getting to enjoy this activity is a dangerous thing. Um, I've seen people where I say, hey, let's go fly. Like, oh, I saw this thing on the news. And if I get a drone, I may get arrested. And, and I don't know where to fly. We're not well, I can help you know where you can and cannot fly. I can connect you to the people like you guys that can give you that knowledge through the knowledge-based test, which, by the way, thank you again uh, for putting so much heart and work into that. I know that was a huge undertaking for you guys. Um, we, can, we can usher people through the relationships of who they need to have and mentor them and make sure that they're good stewards of the airspace and good stewards of the hobby. The FAA is never going to be able to do that. The FAA is never going to be able to have that impact 
and encouragement. All they're going to be able to do is make laws and rules and then hopefully somehow enforce them. What they're going to really do is just discourage people from getting the hobby altogether because people won't know whether they're behaving properly or they're doing something criminal. Yeah, and this is something that we've been very vocal about, especially with the the comments, uh, the comment period that was open for that advisory circular. And I was actually surprised that to see that the community, we were the first one to put out a video about the fact that this advisory circular draft was out there and kind of in you know in space that nobody was really paying attention to. And and I know that you guys put a lot of time in your responses, and I know you 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 had your uh, uh, everyone in the community trying to submit comments as well. But it, but this is where we need to get with the FA. We we need to be able to do this. And I know you and I are in meetings every month with the FA, talking uh, and trying to to give them <laughs> hints of what is going on in the community. So we'll we'll keep doing that for sure. But I know I know um, Kara had a question about the the free as and the remote ID. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I I read the comments, I think, on Ken Heron's recent podcast with you. And as a writer for DP Review, I read the comments and some of them can be nasty. And, you know, I saw one accusing you of basically kowtowing to the FAA. And um, so I just wanted your opinion, like how far you think they're overreaching with um, remote ID and Frias and um how do you want to move forward um, just to have everyone's best interests in mind? Because that's kind of a fine balance between the hobbyists and also mm -hmm. the FAA and um, just curious on your thoughts. Yeah. And that, that's a lot to unpack. I'll, I'll do my best with yes. that and refocus me. Yes. If I, if you I know that's um, hard. <laughs> for, first of all, I want to say this. My goal is to not um, make people happy, uh, but to try to do the right thing. And, um, People have the right in this awesome country to be able to make their own choices. But what I do know is if I say, listen, this is the current law, this is the current standards on remote ID, and I don't agree with it, and therefore I'm not going to comply. That's my right as an individual. But my question to those people, I say I'm kowtowing to the reality that we currently are facing, how do we get that in the schools now? How do we get a local park to accept a new location as a FRIA? if we're not willing to say, okay, here's the current things and the current obstacles that we have to overcome. Flight test was founded from day one on overcoming obstacles. Um, originally with expense, you know, I'd go to someone and say, hey, let's get into the hobby. And they're like, I, it takes too long to build. It's going to be too expensive and I'm going to crash. Our answer was, okay, let's make a build experience. It's a couple hours. Let's use foam board that's common and simple and affordable. And let's embrace the crash because after all, it was only three bucks of foam and it took three hours to put together. Um, those were the hurdles. I'm not kowtowing to the FAA. Do I think remote ID is going to be useful? Criminals aren't going to use remote ID. I'm sorry to say this, but bad people are not going to follow the law. We know that with every other thing under the sun that's been regulated from gun laws down forward. Do I agree with it? No. But do I think that there's a higher calling and a more important thing to say these are the current regulations that we have to overcome? And if we don't overcome or have a solution to meet those, we're never going to get into schools. We're never going to give our community the ability to gather in a public environment and fly and enjoy this great hobby. I don't agree with it at all. I think our freedoms are, are greatly, um, you know, hindered. But at the same time, this is not a constitutional right to bear arms. This is not a, a governmental thing. This is a, an overarching regulatory activity. I don't want to lose the ability to change people's lives because I don't agree with it. I want to adapt and overcome. And uh, it breaks my heart. I don't think I'll ever be able to convince those people. I, they have 100% right to say I will not comply. And as long as they don't do anything illegal or fly in any class airspace, I don't think they're going to get arrested. But I'm not going to bring someone in the hobby knowing what the regulations are, knowing what the hurdles are, and not educate them on how to adapt and participate in the hobby. So. Yeah. I hope that yeah. did I explain that pretty well. Yeah, no, I, I think yes, so. I, yeah, I, I I feel the same way. I, I don't always agree with all the rules, but my role is an yeah. educator, and I gotta I gotta tell you the rules, and I, I'm I'm not here to cloud the judgment and tell you what I think is a good rule or a bad rule. I'm going to let you decide on what you want to do with it, but I'll give you the information. But it's a tough place to be because you know sometimes you want to be vocal, sometimes you are vocal, but it yeah it, it's it's a difficult mm -hmm. position. Yeah. Well, and if, if I was going to try to make everybody happy, I'd be a politician. I mean, no, I'm, I'm not going to win this. No. And, and, and also, <laughs> you, you it's going to, yeah. And I'll never make anyone happy. You know, it's just, no. we're, we're deeper than that. And that's, that's one reason why I value our relationship, that that educational element that you're describing is so crucial.
Yeah, it is. So uh, we're getting to the end of the show, but I, I did have a final question because we always yeah. ask this question of our guests. But for you, it's a little bit different because uh, because you built so many things and you fly so many things. What's your what was your favorite project to build, film, fly, and have fun with? Oh my goodness! Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like every every literally every episode. I don't remember every episode, but I remember one nugget of every episode that's special and unique and weird. Um, there was a point, oh boy. Okay. I, I'm going to pick one of them. And the, if you ask me next week, it won't be that one. But, uh, there was this part where, when we told the community, when we hit a million subscribers, we're going to make a tank fly. And previous to that, we built this crazy big A-10. Uh, we had this mini gun, uh, airsoft in front of it. And we built this big 12 foot tank that, uh, was on the ground. We had to have a target, of course. I don't think we could do this today. Um, but we, we, we had great success in pulling this off. And it was a really special moment, like with all the different aspects that every one of our team members brought. We had one person designing the front end and the hopper to feed this airsoft gun. Uh, we had another person designing the airplane. We had another person doing the lights. And everything came together in just this beautiful collaboration within the team. So it was a real team building exercise. When we hit the million subscribers and all of a sudden the reality hit that we had to make this thing with shot up holes in it that was just never built to fly, fly. It was that whole experience all over again, but also the timing of it, of us just finally getting Edgewater. I think it was one of our very first events that we shot at Edgewater after owning Edgewater. It was the middle of the winter. Weather was terrible. The, the tank was too big to even transport. We had to bring it in pieces and assemble it in like 15 degree weather. And then we pull it out to this hill and suddenly the sun comes out. And it was just one of the most magical moments. We didn't even know that this thing was going to get off the ground. Not only did it get off the ground, but it flew beautiful. And I just remember the team looking at the team thinking, oh, my gosh, this is going to be our life going forward. We're going to be able to, to dream as big as we want and use these grounds to do so. But also during that time was the first time I met John Overstreet, who's now a partner of Flight Test on a business level. He brought his whole family out, and they actually helped us with this project. And it was also the first taste of getting to actually do content with community and with friends. Um, and it was just kind of like, you know, you kind of open up the curtain and you see the potential. That was one of those moments that stayed with us. That was for the whole team. We're all just afterwards and all like, what just happened here? This is, this is going to be a good next chapter for flight test. So I would say that's probably one of my favorite ones. We've, we've done battleships and flying pigs and all that. And next week will probably be my favorite. But that's what comes to my heart right now. That, that, I love it. This is just such a perfect way to finish all of this. Um, Josh, I want to thank you again. Uh, this has been, one of, I think, one of my favorite interviews. And, and I knew it was going to be because, because I, I really appreciate it every time we talk and, and we yeah. talk about next project and, and everything. So um, thanks for all you do. Thanks for all you're going to do in the future. I know we'll have you again. Uh, I want to bring you back because I want to talk about Flight Fest. So maybe when we get closer to Flight Fest, we can talk about that and uh, and and uh, how big of an event it's going to be. But uh, in the meantime, thanks again. And uh, we will be uh, joining you on the YouTube channel. We're going to put a link on the YouTube channel. If anyone out there doesn't know who you are, I don't know how that's even possible, but uh, we'll put a link <laughs> so they can go and follow you and see all the crazy flights yeah. that you guys do. So, uh, But that's it. So if you're uh, if you're watching us, Make sure you like, subscribe, leave your comments down for Josh. I know he's going to read them and, and help answer them. And uh, we'll see you guys for the next episode.